religion or spirituality, if you want. Uh, last time we dealt a little bit with the uh, heart of the First Nation, and I tried to make a distinction, you remember, between religion and the sacred. Religion will be all the visible aspect of the phenomenon, let's say ritual, it will be also uh, behaviors, it, it could be also even belief also. Huh? So everything, at that level I would say we are more on a kind of solid ground because it's something that we can look at and we could describe. The sacred is more difficult to define because it's more subjective. It's the reaction you have toward the unknown, toward the uh, what uh, Rudolf Otto used to call the great other, uh, meaning the, the world of beyond, which could be seen both as dangerous and protective. Uh, and it's, of course, we need religion to filter this kind of uh, numinous type of sacred in order to be able to deal with it. Uh, and that's why uh, this uh, unknown, if you want, is translated into symbols, into uh, a ritual, into prayers and belief and things like that. So there's a relation between both, but it's not always uh, easy to get uh, what is exactly the feeling that some religious people or some people who have religion in front of the sacred. Uh, for instance, you saw with the uh, last lecture how proliferate and how uh, incredibly complex is the mythology of the First Nation. They have a lot of symbols and a lot of uh, ideas how to translate this idea. But when, for instance, I was quoting to you um, a man who's called Robert Joseph, who's a, an Indian chief of the West Coast, uh, and he was, you, you remember, he was describing the Tsonukwa and the grizzly bear and the backwash. And he says all these three were keeping us in line. So what is difficult, of course, for us to understand, it is what is this fear of these beings? Because for us are more or less works of art. Uh, they are very tame in our culture. We, we see them from outside. But when you are in, and it is this aspect, of course, is more difficult. And the people, uh, and now we will deal with, with the lecture of today, the people who understood that maybe the, the more profoundly and right away are the Jesuit missionaries when they came here at the beginning of the colony. And you will see what I will deal with today. It's basically the imagery, the religious imagery of New France, of the, of the beginning of the colony. Uh, it's, uh, you will see it's not great works of art that I have to show uh, because we are really uh, uh, at the very beginning and, and uh, a lot of important works have been lost and all that, but we can reconstruct more or less a certain aspect of what it was. So the missionary right away are confronted to this problem. How to, uh, let's see, uh, make these people, let's see the native people who are in front of them, how to make them understand what is our sacred, uh, what is what we believe in, and eventually, of course, to convert them to this. Uh, this was, missionaries are not there just to, to be nice, they are there to transform the people in front of them into themselves. Uh, so right away, they make kind of uh, negative remarks about the language of the natives, meaning that you cannot really explain our belief to them because they lack the words. Uh, they don't know how to say uh, Jesus Christ and Mary and everything, and, and we don't know how to speak. I, I just quote you one little uh, paragraph of Father Lejeune. Uh, Father Lejeune was a Jesuit priest, was uh, uh, converted from Protestantism himself, so he knew what was conversion was all about. And uh, he speaks of the language of the uh, native, and he says their language is very rich and very poor, full of abundance and full of scarcity, the latter appearing in a thousand different ways, all words of piety, devotion, virtue, all them which are used to express the things of the other life, the language of theologian, philosopher, mathematician, and physician, in a word, of all learned men, all these things are never found either in the thought or upon the lips of the savages. So what you do then when you cannot really transmit through word what is your belief to these people? And then the Jesuit thought, we have the solution, we have to use image. If we cannot explain it, at least we can show what it is. And there's one painting in which I, I think it's perfectly illustrated. And since I work a little bit about it, I, I thought I will throw it to you right away. This painting is uh, 
it's safe, uh, let's say it's, uh, you will find it at the convent of the Ursuline in Quebec City. Uh, the Ursuline have, uh, have uh, their convent, let's say, and a little chapel there, and a beautiful little museum also, uh, well organized and all that. They are very nice nuns, and they, they are very also intelligent and well learned and all that. So they have created, with their treasure, if you want, a museum, so you, you can visit it. It's behind the Chateau Frontac, and it's not very far from the Chateau Frontac, where you have their convent. And in this, you have this relatively big painting, uh, uh, which is called something like the France bringing faith to the Huron of New France. Uh, and uh, it's known since a long time. And let's see, the, the first uh, art historian who dealt with it is Gérard Morisset, who is uh, certainly one of the pioneers of, uh, of our discipline. And uh, he thought that he could attribute it to Brother Luc, uh, Frère Luc. Frère Luc was uh, 1671. So during that time, he made few paintings for, for the parishes around. And Morisset thought, OK, this could be him, because it's a grand genre a little bit, it's a little bit complicated. And he says he could be able to do that. So he attributed to Frère Luc. Then, of course, since Frère Luc was there only 15 months, the datation was obvious. It was 1671. And you, you understand also that he thought it was done here, in Canada, and not exported from France. Uh, then he decided that uh, this part of the picture on the top here, who seems like an addition since you have already the scene that is depicted up there, is already in the, can in the tableau, dans le tableau, huh? in the kind of canvas inside of the canvas, was there. So he says, so this must be, I've been put uh, by some painter, and he thought of Clamondo or whatever other, uh, at a later date. All this that I just said is no more, <laughs> is false, I think, everything. The attribution is not sure at all. And I think you would better call it anonymous because we, we don't know, especially that this type of painting habitually was not done here. It was imported from France. It's an important painting. It's quite grandiose, if you want. And it was bought in France, put rolled in the, uh, around a piece of wood, let's say, put in the, in the, the boat and brought here and then remounted on, on a kind of frame and then put in a church. Uh, so certainly uh, we don't know exactly where it comes from. And the date, of course, you will see is also uh, more complicated to establish. One thing that uh, Maurice said, and I think could be uh, verified, he says that the, the, uh, the, the personage who represents France here is in fact Anne of Austria. And if you take a, a, a detail just of her face and you put in parallel uh, an engraving done by Nanteuil uh, at the, uh, in, nine, in 1666, meaning at the, at the time of the death of this queen, Anne of Austria, uh, well, it's, it's kind of uh, plausible, let's say, uh, parallel. Uh, she, she look, she's not a very nice looking person. She, she was <laughs> but <laughs> I guess both of them try their best with her face, you know, <laughs> because, because uh, Nate was living in France and the other, I don't know where he lived, but it was not a good idea to, to put, look, look for instance what a, a great painter did with, with her face. Uh, Rubens, Rubens, of course, uh, represented her even, uh, even more beautiful. Uh, you, you know, the only painter I know who dare to represent the, the kings like they were, it's Goya, uh, but, but Rubens, no, Rubens is a perfect uh, courtier and, and will never have dared to do that. So, but I think this identification is interesting, it's possible. Uh, but then right away you have a problem because how come that you represent France on, with the personage of uh, the Queen, Han, uh, the Queen um, uh, Han of Austria? Uh, uh, because the, whoops, <laughs> what is this? Okay, the, um, there, there's a problem with that because when, who is Anna Austria? She's the mother of Louis XIV. Uh, when Louis XIV took the throne, uh, when, he, when he, at 21 he decided to, to, to reign, the reign of his, of her, of his mother was over. 
uh, and she, she went to the Val de Grasse, she retired, she was a pious person, so she prayed as much as she can up to her death. But, but, but during that time, if, if the work is 1666, 1671 even, how come Louis XIV would have accept that France will be represented under the, uh, uh, let's say, the vision, uh, the way his mother looked? You understand that that doesn't make sense, and and certainly because there was a way to represent France, I would say in a classic way, and again in this Ruben, the personage who is here is called France receiving the Queen of Marie of Medicis arriving in Marseille. You see, so then there was a kind of conventional way to do it. Uh, she was covered with a with a coat of fleur de lis and with a kind of a helmet on her head. And above her, of course, here as the, uh, the see the renommé uh, with with the trumpet and all that. He is a great, a great queen coming to visit us and all that. But but there was a, a conventional way to do uh, this presentation of France and not to use the portrait of a queen. Huh? So why they did that? And I think the solution is come from a very uh, kind of strange source in a way. You have. The Jesuit did two things uh, uh, as writing, you know, that, that we could know a little bit what, what was happening. They were writing the relation, of course, who are kind of description of uh, what happened, uh, which convert they made, and how, how they proceed, and all that, all the martyr, and so they, they, the Jesuit relation have no sex, but a lot of violence. Uh, it's, it's a terrible text. You see these people torture all the time, martyrize, and all that, but of course, uh, no, uh, no mention of sex. And okay, so that's one, and it's many, many volumes. Uh, they were published one a year, and it started in 1615, more or less, and it ended up to 1617, so uh, 71. So there, there's many volumes of them. But there was also a journal of the Jesuit, meaning that the superior of the Jesuit was noting in short way, to, uh, date by date, what was happening. And there you find in 20 of June, 1666, the following text. He says, the Euron gave us five presents in order to contribute toward the building of our church, among other things, for a picture showing how they have embraced the faith. Wow. When I found that, I said, this is it. This is our picture. Huh? How the Euron embraced the faith. And why, why it's so interesting? It is because, of course, under Anna of Austria, then they embraced the faith. Okay, so the intention of the painting is historical. What they want to show you is what was the circumstances in which the Huron, and that's why it's not called only uh, France bringing uh, the fate to the Indians, but to Huron Indians uh, in, in uh, let's say, at the beginning of the century, when Anne of Austria was the regent of France, and then it makes sense to put her holding the painting in front of the Indians trying to convince him to believe in this uh, new stuff, okay? So the intention of it is, in fact, historical of the painting. Maybe I should go back to it. The intention of this painting is historical, but of course it's done in a kind of allegoric way. Huh? France bringing fate to the Euron. Huh? You see, uh, so you will have the three, the three main elements, and fate being represented in a painting, but uh, referring to real thing up there. So this is, the, of course, the sphere of the divine, and this is a representation of it. This is religion and the sacred, if you want, uh, if you go back to my opposition. So th that's the first thing. And then in 1666, when the queen died, uh, there was in Quebec, of course, a lot of fuss about See, when the queen died, you have to make ceremony and all that. So the, and the Jesuits were, were as good as the others. So they, they decided also to make uh, uh, orasi, oration in her honor and all that. And they were stressing the importance of the queen in the conversion of the Indians. Huh? In, in the, all the discourse that he says, they was repeating that all the time. So I would say at a moment where the Indians were ready to give some money to buy a painting, this theme was in the air. Huh? So you could say, well, 1666 is a good time for, let's see, the, the, the date of the painting. It, it makes sense, or at least from there and a little bit further. Huh? And uh, okay, so th this is the first thing I think that this uh, Anne of Austria doing there, 
uh, could uh, uh, put some light on it. The other thing was interesting, it is what exactly is this painting representing, you know, when the intention is to summarize in one painting the whole content of the faith. Huh? And in fact, you, you have there a theme uh, that, uh, we, that we have many examples in which you see here on the top, uh, God the Father, and you see the Holy Ghost here represented by the classical dove, and finally Jesus Christ here. So you have the Trinity, if you want. Huh? You have the, uh, the, the Father, the, uh, the, the, the Holy Ghost, and the Son. Huh? In, on, under, I would say, a vertical axis. And here on each side, you have the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the other side, St. Joseph. St. Joseph is easy to recognize. He always has this uh, stupid uh, lish, uh, lily in his hand uh, because he was uh, quite a nice guy, uh, as you know. <laughs> the, uh, the first representation of St. Joseph in the tradition is very old, uh, in order that it is clear that he's not the father of Jesus, uh, because the father of Jesus comes from uh, the real father, is the Holy Ghost, it's uh, something else. But and also he's always there. I explain that because I, I, with, the, with the younger people who are not used to all this uh, complicated uh, iconography, uh, sometimes I think it's as obscure as if I was speaking of Buddhism. Or, but uh, anyway, it, it's, when you look at it a little bit from the exterior, it's quite strange. And I, I'm conscious that I have here maybe some Protestant in, in the room, and uh, we are dealing with heavily Catholic type of imagery here. I'm sorry, but th th that's the way it started. Uh, so the first thing is, is this trinity along uh, an axis, uh, vertical, and then you could say they complement it here. Okay, uh, you have Mary on one side, Joseph on the other, Saint Anne uh, uh, here, the, the mother of Mary, and Saint Joachim, I think you say, on the other side, uh, the father of Mary. Uh, so then you could have a kind of extended holy family. Uh, and then if you go on the top, say if you make the relationship now with the top, you find exactly the same personage. Uh, you have Jesus, the Holy Ghost, the God the Father with, with the world. Uh, the Father is the creator of the world, so you have always this big globe in his hands. And then on each side, you have Saint Joseph and Saint Joachim, and on the other side, Mary and Saint Anne. But now they are organized, I would say, under a kind of uh, horizontal axis. Uh, they are all more or the same, comfortably sitting on clouds, you know, it's wonderful, and with little putty here and there to, to make some fluttering of, of wings and, and it, it create, uh, this is the, the world of above, uh, the world of heaven, so it has to be cuter and nicer. And, and down there, you have the same thing, but through a representation. I think this is very uh, interesting because already you have this idea that, and say, I wanted to speak of uh, visionaire and vision, but the first vision, in a way, the first way to see things is through representation. Huh? And okay, this is, of course, it's a very Catholic uh, and very contrary formation point of view. Huh? I think one of the, the great intuition of Luther and of Protestantism, it is the danger of these representation because people, instead of, of relating to uh, the good Lord, they go through images and could stick at, the, at that level. Huh? That was a big issue, of course, between the two, uh, the two sides. Of, uh, and, uh, but there, I think it, it makes perfectly sense. And since this scene here, through uh, analysis let's say, uh, done by uh, uh, Ruggles, uh, uh, Mervyn Ruggles, I think, is one of the chemists of the... Uh, it's uh, in charge of restoration of painting at the National Gallery. And he studied that painting carefully in 1978. And uh, he told then uh, that, uh, no, this is not, uh, I've not been added by Plamondon. It was part of the actual painting when it was done, whenever it was. It, uh, there's no, uh, no repaint, no, uh, it's nothing done after. And it's interesting because then there really the intention is to make a relationship between the scene represented in painting and the scene represented for real, if you want, in, in heaven like this. Uh, we have probably even found uh, some sources of it. Uh, you have here an engraving where, where you see exactly the same personage, God the Father, the Holy Ghost, and Jesus here, and the two 
a woman on the side, the two men, and then two Jesuit saints here, St. Francis Xavier and St. Ignatius of Loyola. So that's interesting also because it maybe it gives us a clue of the first people who ordered the big painting. Uh, the, the, I told you that the painting is at the Ursuline, but I'm not sure that they were the first commanditaire, say the first to order it, uh, the first patron, if you want. Uh, the first were the Jesuit. And when the order of the Jesuit was destroyed or, or were abolished, the, all their treasure, if you want, were distributed to different community around, and the the, uh, the nuns of uh, of this uh, Ursuline got it. I think, but this is a nice indication of this theme being treated with two Jesuit saints, with uh, with Saint Francis and, and Saint Ignatius. So it, it makes sense that uh, there was a, a connection there. Huh? The uh, the theme of this uh, holy family, if you want, holy fa I would say even holy extended family, is very popular in New France at the time, and you have even the creation of. Uh, kind of a lit, uh, little group, let's say, like, like this little pamphlet here, who was published, uh, if I read well, in 1675, uh, I guess, uh, if, you, if you read the date there, La Solide Devotion, La Très Sainte Famille de Jésus, Marie Joseph, avec un catéchisme. So right away, you have a little booklet and how to behave, and, and the Holy Family given as a kind of an example to follow. Huh? And you have also, uh, one reason for that, I think, was important. It is the influence of the Huron people and also of more of the native people at the time that will make shift toward this time of scene the, uh, the, the, to give more and more importance to the uh, Ole family and for a reason you will understand. The, at the beginning, the first type of iconography that the Jesuits uh, use to try to convert the Indian was very often a representation of uh, uh, heaven and hell. Uh, it was simple. It says, if you don't believe, if you don't follow what we are telling you, you are going down. If you believe, well, you look how nice it is with these little fluttering things and all that, you will be there with a harp and with a long dress and you will, for eternity. It looks a little bit boring to me, but anyway, it was... It was uh, a big, that was their first iconography. But when you have Indian being already converted, and not only that, but isolated also in certain villages, like Kaknawaga was like this for a time. They were isolated for the rest of the, of the colonists because they were scared that they would be spoiled by the influence of liquor and whatever uh, coming from the colonists. So they, they, they had the system that is called the reduction. Uh, in which you, you put all the converted Indians together and you isolate them from the rest of their, uh, of their own people and also from the colonists because you don't trust your own people. Uh, you, you don't trust the way they, they will behave. In this type of milieu, the iconography change. You don't need anymore to scare them with hell. Uh, but one of their problems is what happened to our family? What happened to the part of our family who is not converted? Or what happened to our ancestors who have been buried somewhere in, in village near Midland and things like that? How, uh, how can we uh, be separated from them because we are Christian? And then you see suddenly this theme of the Holy Family getting more and more popular in this uh, reduction, if you want, and even all over the colony, because in a way it was a substitute to this real family that they were losing by conversion. Uh, going from, uh, let's see, their uh, first belief and being, uh, becoming Catholic, they were cut from their past, of course, and they needed this kind of conversion. And here, this is probably a, a real Frère Luc picture in which you see a little Huron girl uh, who is converted because you see at her, at her uh, uh, waist, there is a medal there. Huh? And that was a way to, to distinguish the converted from the other. And she come to the Holy Family, you see St. Joseph with his lily all the time, of course, the Jesus with his scepter because he's the king and all that, and Mary behind. So he, he, she come to the Holy Family as a kind of substitute to the real family that she have to leave because of this conversion. Now you understand that 
the, how the, the influence also of the native people on the shift toward another type of iconography that we had at the beginning. Uh, and then you could find example of this holy family, a variation on it as much as you want. Uh, there's a lot of these things uh, who have been imported from France, like the, uh, for instance, uh, this painting that we don't know who, who did it, not very great painting, in which you see again, God the Father, the Holy Ghost, Jesus, and then Mary and Joseph. But it's, okay, I don't debate it. But the, uh, uh, and, and there we don't need Saint Anne and Saint Joachim, to, it's more concentrated. You have a, another example there where he seems to walk, uh, him, always with his bouquet. But anyway, the, you, you have God the Father on the top. You have, again, the Holy Ghost and Jesus and walking on, on this. Uh, th these, uh, all the way through New France, you get these pictures uh, distributed in churches. And for instance, this one was been done by Plamondon, who represents the Holy Family in Egypt. Uh, I think this is why you have a pyramid here and you have a palm tree. Uh. So, uh, and again, the God, the Father, the Holy Ghost, and Jesus was looking vertically like that. You we have, at, it's a copy, of course. Huh? It's not an invention of Plamondon. No. We, we think it's a copy of Jean Restou. Uh, Restou was kind of obscure French painter, but it doesn't matter. And the, we have, we know, at least 30 of these copies in churches in Quebec. Uh. So every churches have one, uh, or they will have an altar devoted to the Ole family. It's really kind of a, a, a popular team, let's say, who was, uh, uh, and you, you have even uh, places or village who was called Saint Famille, uh, and uh, the street were called Saint Famille, uh, everywhere. See? If you begin to, to be aware of it, you would see there's a lot. Uh, and uh, okay, so that's the first thing. The other theme that I want to stress about this big painting, it is the Indians there. You have two, two elements. You have an Indian here that is looking at the queen, and you have also these kind of houses that you have in the back uh, who are not very, uh, as, as much as we know of how the shape of these long houses were, they were not exactly like that. They were rounded rather on the top, and they were not very geometrical like this one. You notice the little cross above, uh, meaning that uh, as if, as much as the the Indian now is kneeling in front of the queen. Well, you could say also the houses have been transformed also in kind of uh, uh, Christian houses also. Uh, the sources of these two elements come from this engraving. If you look here, the, uh, the houses that you have in the back, uh, and here I think, or th these faces here, or maybe some of them here, or these, have been used for the the depiction of the um, of the Indians. What is this? This is a kind of uh, rep kind of uh, uh, non-narrative representation of the martyr of the Jesuit. Uh, you have uh, Father Brebeuf here, Father Jogues, and a uh, few others that were being killed and in different circumstances. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, Grégoire Huret who made um, this representation. The intention was probably uh, two things. He wanted to illustrate a book uh, that was uh, published by Father Ducreux uh, in 1666, so about always the same type of dates that I give before. And also it was published as a sheet, uh, a separated sheet and given like this or, or sold like this if you want for people who wanted to be, uh, to have a, a souvenir of this uh, Martyr of the Jesuit. Huh? And uh, for instance, you, we have uh, in Midland, Ontario, a huge church devoted to them, in which you see, of course, uh, these engravings and this representation. If, if you go back to my picture, say if you compare, for instance, the face of the Indian in the picture with this one, maybe, uh, maybe with a certain little transposition, the headband seems to be the same. The, the the kind of row of pearl around his neck also. It seemed quite obvious that they, they took uh, uh, their, their inspiration from the engraving. Huh? And here, if you make a close up just of the houses, it's evident also that there's the only difference here, the cross is in front of the, of the house and in the final painting, it's above it. Huh? As if we, 
we go further even in the, uh, uh, in the operation of conversion. And not only you convert the people by dressing them like the queen, but also you convert their houses by putting crosses above them, huh? uh, like here. You see, if you compare both, this big cross you have disappeared and it's replaced by a little one on the top. But the, um, uh, the relationship between both is, is the same. It's, uh, it's a, it, it seems to me evident that the, the source of inspiration of the painter was the engraving. Uh, okay. The other thing that we could say, uh, if you go back to, to, to the fact that uh, he, uh, he is dressed like the queen, uh, and this is, is weird in a way. Okay, maybe it wants to indicate that the dominating culture is dominating a dominated one. Huh? But it can indicate also that they are partner, in fact. It's sure that the colony will not have survived without the help of the Indians. Huh? Imagine when people came here for the first time, they have no idea of the winter, of whatever they, they were expecting here. And if it was not of the Indian telling them, let's say, to chew a little bit of, uh, of Tuya Occidentalis, not to get the, the scorbue uh, and uh, a scurvy and all these terrible uh, sicknesses, we will not, have, we will not be here. Huh? So maybe it's a way also to recognize their importance. You dress them like the queen. Huh? You, you, you indicate, of course, a domination since it's on his knee. But also you recognize more or less since the don't forget, the intention of the picture was to uh, stress the fact that we will show how, in which circumstances, the Indians were converted to Christianity. Uh, so maybe uh, there is more than just this. The, the final thing that I, I wanted to, to, to stress, it is the very problem, let's say, of transmitting faith through a picture. Uh, you remember in the beginning of the lecture, I said their language is not good enough. Uh, they, that's what the Jesuits taught, and they said we should use image for that. And when you have uh, in art history a situation like that, it's always good to try to make a parallel with other pictures in which you have a little bit the same type of situation. And this parallel was suggested by uh, the John Russell Harper. He's uh, an immensely nice man uh, that I, I have a lot of respect for and all that, but I'm not sure he's right th this time. No, but he was a wonderful man, and yeah, I, I will not tell you too much story about him. I, I, I love, he, he's now with God, so for sure, but he, uh, he uh, <laughs> okay. And he thought, okay, he says, let's think in the tradition what situation in which you will have somebody uh, bringing uh, knowledge, a certain type of knowledge, through a picture. Uh, and he thought of this, which is not a bad idea at first. Uh, it is the presentation of uh, the portrait of Marie de Médicis to Henry IV. Uh, and since he will marry her before meeting her, he, the, uh, the, she had her portrait made and they brought it to him. Uh, look how nice she looks and uh, do you agree to marry her? Anyway, uh, to agree. Uh, there was no question. It's all these marriages were organized and things. And uh, he seems to be happy. And above him, of course, the Juno with her peacock. That's the, the goddess of marriage and all that. So indicating that uh, Everything will be good. Uh, but the situation with the, my Indian and the queen and the painting is so different that I thought we, we should find another parallel will be better. And this one is a, a little bit unexpected because I found it in a book of La Hontan. Uh, La Hontan was not a friend of the Jesuit at all. He was uh, even a kind of libertine, if you want a very... Free, mind, uh, free minded man. Uh, but he, he made a, a book, it's called Dialogue Curieux entre l'auteur et un sauvage de bon sens qui a voyagé. Uh, this is a wonderful title of the 18th century. Uh, dialogue, curious dialogue between um, uh, the author and um, a native uh, with a good, uh, with his, in his good mind and who have also traveled a lot, meaning that he, he is cultivated, he's learned. And indeed, this dialogue is interesting because he confronts all the time the uh, belief of the Christian with, uh, with the, I would say, the very rational mind of the Indian. And he's always asking very inquisitive question for whom the other, oh, can you ask such a thing? It's terrible. And, and he, well, in, indeed, you have no answer. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a little bit uh, uh, out of... Uh, 
of the, the pay. And, and the, the way you represent the things here is much closer to, to our situation. You have Indian, who have a, two gentlemen here, that are explaining a painting which is probably about God creation of the world. Uh, if you see, you have the moon, you have the sun, you have stars, and you have here God the Father on a cloud. I cannot read as easily what is in the bottom of the picture, but I think we are not too far to think that what is the subject of the painting is something like the creation of the world. Uh, and in behind, of course, you have uh, palm tree. Uh, this is very Canadian, as you know. And even <laughs> coconut tree, as I said, then I really exaggerate. But anyway, and these uh, ridiculous houses, you see, who are just tunnel. I, I, it's like uh, uh, Nancy Old. <laughs> Cement <laughs> tunnel in the middle of nowhere, but anyway, the the, uh, the the presentation is funny a little bit. But the idea of using a painting to transmit a knowledge to the Indian is there uh, exactly, uh, and this usage was maintained after uh, for many many years. And uh, what is interesting in the, what I want to show you, it's, it's painting of 19th century at this time in which you will see exactly the same type of approach, but with different type of iconography because the situation is not the same. Yeah. Here, it's little picture done by a guy who was called Father Point, yeah. Nicolas Point, oh, like point, if you want. It's written like point, P-O-I-N-T. Uh, but he's a Frenchman, so I guess we should pronounce point. And the, uh, he went to Oregon, yeah. so in completely different type of milieu, and in 19th century. And he used, he liked to draw, and he make a, a, a very nice looking manuscript uh, with little drawings like this one. And uh, about this picture, he says the following. He says, during my stay at Westport, I was visited occasionally by Indians. Among these visitors was the Grand Chief of the Kanza. Before him, three members of his tribe had visited me. Although you see Father Point here in the middle. And you have uh, not three, but two. And behind you have a picture. And here you have a little statue, statuette, uh, statue, let's see, here of the Blessed Virgin with seven, uh, ha not arrows, seven swords in her heart, uh, uh, meaning le, le, the, all the pain she had. Uh, uh, let's say, les sept douleurs, comme on disait, in my, uh, my childhood. After giving each one a small present, I conducted them to the chapel. It appears that they had never seen anything like it. They advanced, retreated, stood still in their track, peering in front of them and behind, up and down, to the right and the left. Most of all, they were unable to control their great astonishment at seeing the heart of the Blessed Virgin pierced with the seven swords and the head of our Lord crowned with thorns. They pointed out to one another uh, the gesture they did not understand. What seems to impress them the most were the large tears flowing from the eyes of our Lord. They asked each other who is this person might be. Then a woman who spoke their language told them that it was the Son of God who wept for our sins. This seems to touch them, says Father Point. I'm not sure what I think they did. They were astonished by this kind of... Uh, or, uh, torture. Uh, you have many cultures in the West who had ceremony of a keeper or others in which the young warrior were put to, to, to this type of torture. Uh, but there it was going a little bit far to have seven swords in your heart, you know. This is really uh, doing a little, they were cutting their nose, cutting a finger, okay, but seven swords in the heart and then a crown of, uh, of spine and all that. So they, I think they were impressed by Wow, what is a culture there? They really, they are tough on their people, you know. They, they, they have to go through really difficult uh, uh, ordeal. I, I think that's what. But anyway, Father Point succeeded. He, he, he transformed the, these people in good Christian. Now, wait a minute. And, and here you see them con, uh, making confession. Huh? He, he's, uh, he's sitting, and nearby there's an Indian confessing his sin. And on the wall, of course, you have all these images, say the crosses and everything. And the others are cleaning the place. They're very good people, uh, behaving perfectly. And uh, I think the comment he did on this painting, something, Indians publicly confessing fault reveal inadvertently their heroic virtue. You see, as if 
they, they confess really uh, picadillos, uh, things are of no, no importance. A more interesting picture is this one. Because here they are, they are teaching themselves religion. You see, they are all around here sitting together. They have little cards in their hands, meaning they have little picture uh, to, to look at. And with captions and all that, okay, this is the Blessed Virgin, this is the uh, God, the Holy Father, and everything. And so they have these little cards. And then here on the wall, you have a chart uh, where, and, and you have one in the with a little stick. We explain to the two others there what it means. Uh, and I think we have discovered more or less this type of chart, what it is. Uh, here you have it on entier, if you want, all of it. And here you have just a detail of the top of it. This was uh, rolled uh, on a, uh, it's a, it's a, let's say, an engraving glued on a piece of canvas and rolled like this. So what I imagine is probably the priest will, will unroll this, will fix it on the wall, a little bit like in the picture of Father Point, and then will become to explain what it is. Uh, for instance, you have here, uh, say, God the Father, you have here a representation of heaven, and here you have purgatory, and here you are hell. Okay, and then you have two ways, okay? You have the central way, of course, is the way of religion, but you could go to the left, and as you know, the left is always bad, uh, you, you know that. <laughs> the left is sinister. And the, the word, the word uh, left in Latin is sinister, uh, sinister. And uh, so the people who go to left, guess who, who they were? They were the Protestant, uh, and they end up in hell. Uh, and the good people who go to the right were the Catholic, and they end up, okay, maybe some of them in purgatory for a little while, they, they need brushed up, or directly to, to heaven. Huh? The funny thing it is that you have an example of a Protestant preacher, it's called Spalding, in Oregon, where Father Poe was operating at the same time, who used the same means, except that what you see going to hell here is the Catholic Church, and who, <laughs> The one who goes directly to heaven are the Protestants. Huh? It's wonderful because they were using exactly the same type of system. But there you understand that the iconography is different. Huh? It is still the idea of preaching through picture, but now they have a situation that's different because you have competition between two faiths. Huh? So you have to create a, an iconography around the theme of the two ways, the good and the bad ways. Huh? I think it's what... Uh, and so you have a kind of adaptation of this iconography, but the system stayed. And this picture dates of 1872 about, uh, or 70, 1870. So even at the end of 19th century, they were still using this type of approach. Uh, uh, that's why uh, when I mentioned at the beginning that the, the representation of the symbols like this to, uh, to uh, understand religion was certainly uh, seen as a very uh, uh, important one. Okay, we will quit now the, uh, the situation of the, of the mission and to introduce uh, another type of work, uh, the so-called ex voto. Uh, what, what it is, the ex voto is a little picture that somebody who had some trouble, let's say, who was uh, in uh, mere dangers and all that, promised to give, if he's safe from danger, to, let's say, uh, an important church. And in Quebec, of course, the most important one for that is Saint-Anne de Beaupré. Uh, I think you know where it is. It's near Quebec City. So you go out of Quebec toward the, uh, the sea, if you want, and then on the north shore of the Saint-Laurent, you have this huge church, like the Saint-Anne de Beaupré, and you have also there a kind of museum. It's called L'Historial, or je sais pas quoi, et, uh, and where these uh, ex voto are collected and where you can see them. So what, I, what was the situation habitually? It was, a, let's see here in this case, it's a family who had some trouble. And so they promise that if they are saved from their trouble, that they will give a little painting to the shrine there. And the painting will be, of course, exhibited there to show how powerful was the saint Anne who saved them from, from their, from their uh, problem. This one is, is, is more, I would say, uh, should be called, uh, um, uh, a painting of recommendation. Why? It is because the personage who is represented here are people relatively wealthy. Uh, the, the, the woman here, we know who she was. She was Madame Riverain with her four children. 
Huh? She had one after, uh, they are quite close together. And the, uh, she had three girls and one boy, and the boy, of course, is near her, and much uh, with a kind of beautiful little red coat. And uh, Madame Rivrain had the uh, bad luck to have a bad husband. And that's why she went into, the guy was, uh, was a bum, he was always uh, here and there, and dispersing his, uh, his, uh, the money of the family and all that, and suddenly she, he disappeared in France for, for many years and all that, and so she was very worried about the, her future. But since it's come from a kind of high bourgeoisie, she didn't want to show the real cause of her trouble. Well, mind you, it would have been terrible to see a man drinking and all that. But so, the, uh, so she saw her family and recommend herself to Saint Anne. Uh, why we think it's Saint Anne? Because this iconography is very typical. When you see an old lady with a book, uh, this is Saint Anne because habitually she's represented like the one who made the education of the Virgin. And uh, maybe you know this famous painting of Rubens in which you see exactly that. You see Saint Anne, he's here with a book, and here the, the, uh, Mary, the, the Holy Virgin, is there, and, and she's teaching her how to read and what to read and things like that. Huh? So it's typical of this iconography. When you see a woman like this with a little book, it has to be Saint Anne. Huh? Then if you compare it to what we have before, we don't have any more the... Um, the holy people represented in a painting. Huh? What we have is rather the apparition of the holy people. Huh? You could see maybe what the painter wanted to do is to show how it is in their mind. Huh? And of course it's derivative from other picture, but now it took almost the, a real presence. Huh? The only distinction between her world and the world of, uh, of us uh, now that is this row of clouds here. Uh, that isolate her in a kind of different world. But now she's more, much more present. She's not just a picture. It is the real thing that happened in your life, uh, that enter inside of your, uh, of your uh, circle, if you want. Look, another example of this ex voto is this one. Uh, here is the captain of ship. Event, uh, see, he put his ship in the back there. And there, okay, then it's easy to understand that uh, a ship on the sea could have a lot of trouble and uh, could, uh, could have been at loss, and the, the, all the sailors promise, you see, if we are saved from this mess, you see, if the storm stop, whatever, we will be able to, we will give a, a painting to Saint Anne de Beaupré. Huh? And uh, the, w what we think, of course, all this is very hypothetical. Huh? You have a painting, you don't have uh, author, you don't have dates, you don't know where it comes from. And uh, many um, historians, let's say, have tried their, their hand on this painting, saying that it may be this, it may be that. What we think, uh, what is more generally accepted, let's say, it is the, the man who is here is d'Iberville, huh? Pierre Lemoyne d'Iberville. And Pierre Lemoyne d'Iberville is not very popular in the um, history of Canada in, uh, of, uh, I when it's written in English. But I tell you, when it's written in French, he's a very popular guy because he beat the Anglophone in Hudson Bay once. Huh? So we, 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 it's a hero of, uh, of Quebec. And uh, so that's why the historians who are, who are Quebecers uh, in this case have thought it is de Berville. And they, they, they find that at, at a certain point, he, he was on a, on a ship, let's say, and his brother was another ship. This one was called La Salamandre, the Salamander if you want, and this one was called Le Poli, meaning the polite one. Uh, so ev evidently you have two ships here, and there is a Jesuit who have accompanied their expedition to the Hudson Bay, and tell in his journal that uh, at a certain point, uh, no, uh, the problem was not so much that there was a storm, but there was no more wind. So the, the boat stopped, and everything was quiet, so they could not fight, they could not do anything. So they said, okay, if ever we, the wind come back, we will give a painting to, to Saint Anne de Beaupré and, uh, be, and uh, the painting will be, uh, will be paid by the game we will make on the English. Huh? Meaning that they were sure to win and so they will take a, a, a bounty and with this they will pay the, the canvas. Huh? So this possible. There's many problems with that. The first one, I think, it is look at the style in which the boat is depicted and the style of the rest of the picture. There's a big difference there. And this seems very naive in a way, and the other seems very sophisticated. So, habitually, this is a little bit complicated situation. Then, if you look carefully on the ground here, 
you have tiles, uh, and this is not a thing you will find normally in a boat. Uh. In a boat, you will have planks. You will not have tiles. And this personage, in my mind, looks too much like D'Iberville to be really uh, an old portrait. What happened, you see, most of these great men uh, of our short history didn't leave any portrait. Uh, they, they didn't even think of it. You think we know the, the real face of Champlain, of Cartier, of all these people. We have an image in our mind, but these images were done in the 19th century, much after the fact. Uh, and they are completely fanciful. And I'm, I'm afraid that D'Iberville is this too. If he was not looking like the popular image of him, I would say, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's okay. But he looks very much close to it. So all this make it difficult to date and to attribute. And the subject is certainly something dealing with a captain of ship having trouble at sea. So this is easy to understand. But more than that, can we say, I, I'm not sure. Uh, like here, the Saint Anne is very elaborated. You see, she has her book, and she has the Blessed Virgin there, who, who says, "Okay, give me this." I don't know what it means—a a little book and a piece of paper. Uh, what it is. some some historians have suggested that it could be the act of redition of the English when they were b uh, beaten in the Hudson Bay. They have to give a paper. Okay, we accept. Uh, we, we will give you this and that. So they r write it down, and it could be that. But again. All this can be very, very hypothetical and fanciful. We don't know. But it's a good example, again, of uh, this type of ex voto situation. Here, one more. Uh, this one is my favorite because uh, everything is very clear. Yeah. You have to read what, what it, everything is written on it. So I will read it in French and, and comment it. Ex voto, Jean-Baptiste Auclair. Uh, this is the name of uh, one of the boys. Et Louis Bouvier. This is him. Marc Feuilleteau. Tous trois sauvés. Alors, Marc Feito, I think, is this one. But there's two others who were not saved. Uh, tous trois sauvés means all, the three of them have, having been saved. M-R-I here that you have there is probably Maria. Uh, it's like an abbreviation for Maria Chamar. And then you have Angé de 21 ans. Uh, this is interesting because the, the, uh, they give, uh, of, the, uh, of some of them, they give... The, their age, exactly. Uh, like here, Marguerite Champagne, age de 20 ans et un jour. Uh -uh. Okay, she was 20 years and one day only. So I suspect that they had a party on the sea. Uh, they, they went, uh, come with us, we have a birthday party, it's your birthday, da, 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 da. and then pss, suddenly the, the boat capsized and, and here they are in big trouble. Alors, tous deux noyés. Alors, the two girls were were drowned, these two. Uh, one was 20 years old and the other was 21. And uh, when you think of it, the two boys there saved their life. They are not very um, gallant. <laughs> and uh, Saint Anne should have punished them instead of, uh, instead of saving the two girls. They, they jump on the boat and save themselves. But anyway, and okay. And then they give the date, the 17th juin, 1754. So you have a date. Huh? And uh, à deux heures du matin. Alors, alors, when I saw that, two o'clock in the morning, what are you doing on the, on the river at this time? So you should be at home. You should be sleeping in your bed. And, and so you, you feel that through the, this kind of very terse type of text, you have a little story there who is interesting. Huh? Tout cinq dans ce triste état. All of them in a very sad situation, se recommandant à la bienheureuse Saint Anne. Uh, recommending themselves to this is a typical ex voto uh, and in fact what you have here is Lévy here you have the Ile d'Orléans uh, and here probably Beauport or maybe already saint anne de Beaupré, who is suggested here and this is St. Lawrence River so it's it's the sad story of five kids who went on the St. Lawrence River in the middle of the night and got uh, in trouble and two of them died and the three other uh, give this little naive painting, probably done by maybe one of them, for all I know, in which, again, you see Saint Anne with her little cloud uh, uh, isolant. <laughs> She's like isolated around with clouds. And uh, then the, uh, the ex voto. Uh, uh, another example of the same kind. Here you could, you could understand what happened. It is a man who's called Dorval. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, of course, a uh, lumberjack, and he was not very clever. So anyway, the, the tree fell on him, 
but he had a dog. Huh? And the story goes that the dog went uh, with a little piece of bark, and in which he wrote, probably, I'm in big trouble somewhere. <laughs> so the dog went and bring back people, and he was saved. So he promised, of course, if he was saved, he will give his, uh, his ex voto to St. Anne again. Uh, you understand how, how it's done? There, the problem, it is that uh, this painting, I think, we, we, uh, seems to be uh, uh, not a copy, but a kind of reinterpretation of another painting who had been lost. So we, we know because the, uh, in Saint Anne de Beaupré, they have a lot of archives and they, they note everything. So they have a description of this situation exactly, but the painting was lost at a certain point. And what we think it is that um, uh, one of the priests there says, oh, it's too bad to have lost that. And he asked a uh, kind of amateur painter of, uh, of our days, so Monsieur Boivin, uh, in around 1945, 1949, let's say about that period, he asked to make a painting uh, illustrating a written description of what happened. Huh? You understand how it was done? So it's not really a copy of an old painting who's lost, it is a reconstruction through a, a text. Huh? He, he knew more or less what happened, and he, he did, a sa manière, in his way, uh, what, what happened. Uh, and, the, and always the popular ex voto like this one show the trouble in which the man was or the woman was. The, the ex voto of recommendation don't show it. Uh, you remember Madame Rivrain don't show the trouble in which she was. But uh, this is typical. When it's a more popular class, let's say, they, they, they tell you exactly what happened and uh, it's a, this is a good example of it. This is another uh, quite interesting case. I don't know if I take too much of your time, but anyway. The, this is the same painting. Uh, it's, a, it's called the ex voto of the uh, woman ward at Hotel Dieu in Montreal. Here. Huh? It's the same painting, but here it's before restoration and here it's after restoration. Okay? So what happened here in, in the old painting, uh, Christ was almost naked. And I guess some nuns uh, find it uh, not proper. Huh? And she decided to dress him up. Huh? <laughs> and uh, so now he have a cloak and he looks uh, more masculine also. And uh, she put the clouds and everything and she fixed it nicely. Huh? <laughs> but, but for the rest, it's more or less the same thing. Huh? If you, now, if I show you the, the painting as it should have been, what is surprising also, it is that the older painting is a little more sophisticated than the new one. As if, say, habitually, you have the opposite. You have a kind of naive painter at the beginning, and then it's corrected by more clever artists, you see, that come after and correct this and correct that. Here's the opposite. Huh? Here it is, and I, because why, why it's like that, it is because, imagine if you were nuns in a, in a, in a w hospital ward, and suddenly Jesus Christ arrives here dressed with the, Almost nothing on a, with a la petite guinée. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be a scandal. It was, it's probably not right. You know, it's probably not him. And uh, <laughs> so, the because of this kind of situation, I, I think they, they felt, oh, we, we have to correct this. It's too bad. It, uh, we, we cannot. And when when the, the painting was clean, and we discovered that. Also, the inscription was not exactly the same. Well, it was the same idea. In the first inscription, is this famous uh, word, la, I was naked and you dress me and I was, a f uh, I was starving and you feed me. And say, you, you know, this part of the gospel. Here, it's, it's called me feches. Me feches means you did to me. Huh? When you were helping all these poor, you are, in fact, helping me, uh, Jesus Christ. Huh? The, this is a lot. Uh, me feches, uh, it's good Latin. It me it means to me and feches, uh, to, to do, to, uh, to faire, uh, faire. And uh, so that was probably clear also for the nuns at the time. And then after, they put it in French and more, more at length. Uh, you see the, the two period. Above the bed here, you have uh, indication, just two letters, SM, Sancta Maria. And if you were in the ward of the men, on the other side, you will have S.G., St. Joseph. Huh? Like, for instance, in this picture of Duncan here, it is the same system, but here, he met St. Joseph, here, he met St. Marie. Huh? Although the girls were there, the boys were there, and of course, there's a big wall in between. Huh? So, so, 
there's no fooling around there. You just put it. But, okay. Okay, I go from the ex voto. Uh, I start with, okay, when, see, I just summarized a little bit where we are. We started with, okay, the other world represented in the picture and then being more present, if you want. And finally, what you, you get, it's almost a kind of familiarity with this unknown. Huh? Like here, you have two benefactors of the Hotel Dieu of Quebec, the, the Duchesse de Guillon here and Cardinal Richelieu. And both are in prayer in front of a kind of an apparition. Huh? Here you have a kind of cross, a luminous cross, and here she have a heart, a bleeding heart, and uh, both of them are praying, and suddenly they see in their prayer well, uh, the other world, in a way, huh? this kind of immediate contact. And I guess the, 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 the most typical uh, representation of this type of familiarity, it is uh, all the representation turning around the theme of the guardian angel. Huh? This is a, a kind of good example of it. It's done by uh, Brother Luc for a parish who's called like this, L'Ange Gardien, huh? the guardian angel, near Quebec City. Between saint anne de beaupre and Quebec, you have this little village it's called L'Ange Gardien. They had this painting of Frère Luc in their church, but now it's in the Museum of, uh, of Fine Arts of Quebec City, uh, in Quebec, uh, Le Musée National des Beaux-Arts, like they call it now, and the, uh, because the, the parish could not really take care of an old painting like that. This is really Brother Luc, and it's 1671, so they, they give it to them. But there you have, uh, I would say, almost the team uh, uh, at, at, at its perfection, because there's no more clouds around the angels. Uh, he's part of your world. He, he's near you. I remember when I was a kid, we were always sitting in a bench like this a little bit on the side to leave a, a place for our guardian angel. You know, <laughs> after all, the, you have to sit with us, so we were, we were doing it. So really, uh, okay, then what he's doing, he's pointing to heaven where you see uh, the name of God in Hebrew, but with a mistake. I know a little bit of Hebrew, so I can't tell you that. Uh, say, uh, he want to write uh, Jehovah, of course, uh, but he write Yehovah. And uh, the, the het and the he in Hebrew are very close together. They, they look alike, if you want, but uh, you make a mistake again where you doesn't know it. And, uh, and then, if he's pointing there, there's a snake here. Huh? This is not a very good idea if you want a man to avoid the snake. Huh? If you go, look down. <laughs> no, <laughs> look down. <laughs> anyway, there's some naivety in this. But what is interesting there, it is this kind of familiarity. And there is, of course, an iconographic tradition behind that. I think most of it comes from the book of Tobias. Huh? When you know the story, when... Uh, this uh, whole t Tobit was blind, and he sent his son to fetch some money somewhere. And on the way, uh, the son meet an angel, but the angel, of course, is not, is not with his wing and all that. He looks like uh, ordinary people. And uh, they are near a river, the Tiger River, and uh, they see suddenly a big fish coming out. And uh, so the angel says, take that fish, take the, um, the gall, and the liver and the, uh, the gallbladder, the liver and the heart of the fish. And with this, you will be able to heal your father um, uh, blindness. Huh? You remember that, that story. So this, of course, I've given uh, way to uh, the thousands of representation in, uh, in art history, like this one that I like very much, Andrea del Ver Verrocchio. Uh, you see, he holds the fish, but it's not very big here. Huh? He holds the fish with one finger, you have a little piece of paper, which is, uh, it's called in Italian Ricordo. Uh, this is the, the paper, of course, that his father gave him in order that he will be recognized by the man who owe him money. Huh? So you have a little uh, document here. And here the angel with his wings and all this, all the a little box in which you have the liver of the fish that will be used to heal the father. Huh? And it, there is a dog there also, huh? kind of, I don't know which kind of dog this, kind of poodle or something. This is very rare in the Bible. Uh, there's not too mention of dogs in the Bible. Mind you, the book of Tobias is not even in the Hebrew Bible. It's a kind of uh, posterior addition. Uh, but uh, the mention of the dog is funny there. Uh, and behind them, it's supposed to be the, the Tigris River. Uh, it's one of the sweetest representation of that. Uh, sometimes uh, it's more seduced, like this, like Filipino Lippi, 
uh, you had a little dog also, but the people look more uh, like, uh, to more careful uh, looking at each other like this. Huh? Look, for instance, what Perugino did with the same thing. I think the dog is here, but he, he, looks, uh, <laughs> he looks like a sheep, I don't know what. Uh, yeah. oh, this, this is one of the favorite ones, it's Rembrandt. And even Rembrandt was so realistic and so close to the, uh, to the, the text of the Bible. He showed very well Tobias uh, dealing with a big fish here and the, the angel with his stick, you see, just looking at it and saying, okay, okay, do that, do that. He gave him order what to do and all that. And, uh, but even Rembrandt kept the wings of the angel. Huh? Because, and this is contrary to the text, because in the text he has no wings. He, he, it's just at the end, after the, the old man is healed, then the angel goes in, in heaven. Uh, just at the end he reveals his own his, his real identity. But suppose that if there was no wings there in a picture, you will not know that it's Tobias' story. Uh, and so even there he needed to have it. Uh, and when you saw the painting, in the, uh, the church of L'Ange Gardien, uh, the first painting I show you of the Frère Luc, there was also two big sculptures on each side of it, one representing St. Michael, and one uh, the angel Michael, if you want, was uh, really uh, uh, crushing the dragon, uh, crushing the, uh, let's see, the evil. And on the other, the other uh, uh, angel here, I've written on his chest, Ave Maria, so this is Saint Gabriel, uh, and here in his hands, it's no more there, but he have also this famous lily uh, that I mentioned too many times. <laughs> okay. And to finish, let's see, you have the, another example of this kind of familiarity between uh, the angels, uh, the, 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 mom, the world of beyond with our world. Now protecting a little girl. Uh, again, we don't know who is the painter here and who is the subject matter really. There is hypothesis, but they are all uh, not based. But what I thought it was interesting, it is in this theme that you get suddenly this very closeness, this very familiarity between the two worlds. Uh, you remember I said that one of the the function of religion was to separate the two worlds. But one also of the obsession of Catholicism is to put them together. Uh, and through symbolism and through picture and through all this representation, you try to create this familiarity. Uh, I think this is one of the big issues, of course, between the two, um, uh, the, the two paths, let's say, that Christianity have took the importance of this symbolism, of this familiarity, or the maintenance of a certain transcendence, a certain distance. And if you, of course, communicate with God through the text only, uh, through the Bible, through the text, then, of course, you don't, have, you don't need all these images. Uh, and you know the Catholic were always a little bit suspicious of the text. Uh, we need uh, to control more what the people have in their mind, and they created all this iconography. The last thing I want to stress also, it is the importance of the Indian uh, input in this iconography. Uh, you remember what I told you about the Holy Family? Uh, it comes partly from them also. Uh, and uh, so there is there a kind of complex history at the beginning of, the, of this colony, you see, of this, all this imagery that maybe now is receding from our memory uh, in grand, grand partie. But, uh, but you understand that it was powerful at a certain time. And again, it's a good example of this type of uh, relationship between the religion and the sacred. Okay, we'll finish with that. Next time we will do uh, one painter in particular, Osias Le Duc, uh, who is closer to our time. And we will deal with his religious iconography, who's a little bit complex, but I will try to be clear and to, to explain it to you. Okay, thank you.